It's beautiful to be in a room with so many fellow members of the Tamashi fan club, the Colorado chapter. <laughs> I feel like, you know, normally there's a brief thanks, but honestly there's uh, many people in the room who could be thanked for the creation of this exhibition. So um, I do want to thank Wally Bakari for being a sponsor of the exhibition. Thank you, Wally. Um, and I do want to acknowledge Scintilla Foundation, um, Rebecca and Helen, for their first sponsoring Tamashi's residency at Spoon Art House. Uh, this was the context through which uh, Chamashi's love for Colorado deepened um, and uh, was pivotal to the creation of this project. But I'm also seeing Doug Smook, who put Chamashi up for quite a while in his home. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Adam Gildar, our videographer, for one of our videos. Um, here's Stuart. Thank you, uh, Megan Farkas of Tilton Gallery. Um, it's really, you know, some projects really feel like a, a village. It takes a village, you know. Because I'm, I'm the child. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's such a, but honestly, it's such a beautiful thing. And Ellen Bruss, one of our lenders, is also here. Thank you, Ellen, for your exquisite painting in the show. Um, so, uh, I, am, it, I am so pleased to introduce to Mashi, someone many of you already know well, but we are going to celebrate some of her career highlights before beginning the conversation. Um, so, Tamashi Jackson was born in Houston, Texas and raised in Los Angeles, California. She received her MFA in painting and printmaking from the Yale School of Art in 2016, her Master's of Science in Art, and Culture, and Technology from the MIT School of Architecture and Planning in 2022, and her BFA from the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art in 2010. Jackson's work has been included in recent solo exhibitions at, in addition to MCA Denver, the Parish Art Museum, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University, and the Wexner Center for the Arts. She has participated in numerous group exhibitions, including Off the Record at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, the 2019 Whitney Biennial, Hinge Pictures, Eight Women Ocu Artists Occupy the Third Dimension at the Contemporary Arts Center in New Orleans and in the Abstract at Mass MoCA. Her artworks are in numerous museum collections, including the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, the Whitney Museum for American Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, the Baltimore Museum of Art, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Perez Art Museum in Miami, and Tamashi currently lives and works in Cambridge and in New York City, although of course we're working on her Denver relocation. <laughs> Um, so, uh, we are seated here in Tamashi Jackson across the universe, which is Tamashi Jackson's first mid-career survey, um, which covers nine years of work. And the, the period that, in which, at the Congdon Gallery, you're seated amongst more recent work um, from uh, 2019 to 2022. Um, and it's really a special opportunity to be with you here, Tamashi, because we're going to ask questions that's, that and the arc of all the amazing things you've created. And um, because Tamashi just a few hours ago shared with me a sound, a sound collage that is in progress, I thought it actually would be helpful to start with the idea of collage or that of layering. Um, because if you go through this exhibition, you will see that layering has always been a, an incredible part and an integral part of Tamashi's practice from the works that go all the way back to, um, a, you know, over 10 years ago to um, even more recently, and even works that are in progress. So um, that's a long wind up to say, uh, or to ask if you want to talk about the use, the, the, the approach to collage that informs your work. Thanks, Miranda. Um, and thanks everyone for being here, for taking the time to come and spend some time with us in the show. Um, it's such an honor to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer that question kind of. You're actually, you're probably gonna have to remind me what the question is because I, I need to say, I need to say some thank yous as well. So I agree with all of the thank yous that Miranda offered. It wouldn't be possible without MCA Denver and their belief in this project and their partnership with Scintilla Foundation that made me so at home in Boulder at Swoon Art House last summer. Um, Adam Gildar being my steward in the San Luis Valley and the Frontier Drive-In, um, uh, Ellen and Mark making me um, welcome there. And then, um, uh, um, oh gosh, help me, Alluvian Studio. Did I say it right? 
Okay, Alluvian Studio, a studio that's, that's in progress being built by Kansas Cityites um, who were becoming uh, Coloradans um, let me stay there when I, when I felt called back to the San Luis Valley. And you all will see when we get downstairs why this becomes so important. Um, and really I want to thank the, the staff here at MCA Denver for hanging this show. Um, most of the work was done before I got here where I met uh, Matt Murray and um, uh, Derek Penny and Mike Howard and uh, Breezy Sanchez and Witt who's currently storing our huge crates. To get this show here was just uh, quite a feat and Megan um, at Tilton Gallery and Davida and the crew at Night Gallery, um, they all, everybody made this possible. So I'm not at all um, alone and I'm so grateful. Um, so that, that's a lot of layering. We're layering a lot of humanity to even make this show possible and I'm really honored. And we have a catalog that's coming out, a Rizzoli catalog that will follow the show as it travels across the country uh, for the next two years. <sighs> yeah, so layering, what's the question? We, pre we prepared, but I'm not going to remember anything. We did prepare. We promised we prepared. And I, I mean, I, and I really want to thank my, my incredible visionary curator, Miranda Lash. I mean, this is, she's just... Uh, and we together want to thank the ARC Athens residency that brought us together uh, the last normal summer in 20... Or what, it felt like summer in Greece, but it was really fall in uh, 2019 uh, we were, where we were brought together in, art, in a residency that specifically brings together artists and curators. Um, and I want to just take one more second to um, thank you all again for being here and for caring about arts in Colorado, arts and humanities uh, in Colorado and your community and um, urge us all to continue to see ourselves as um, uh, the, the, the spearheads for uh, supporting, funding, um, enrichment in our communities wherever we are because it's all this teamwork that made this possible and, um, and that continues to be the case. We can't be passive about arts and humanities in our communities. We have to be the actors. So um, I only get to be here because of so many people making it possible. Um, and, my, and my curator is amazing. Like she really is amazing um, because you had this vision for this show um, and you really um, insisted so, um, uh, yeah, so, so Larry, so. Larry, they didn't yeah, know. Yeah, it just happens, so it happens a lot. We, we were roommates in Athens, Greece, and they honestly didn't know what we were going to get up to in that process. I mean, we so, didn't know. <laughs> and we didn't know each other before that, you know, so like, uh, uh, especially where we're, we're sitting here in the midst of a very historic strike of artists um, uh, in, uh, across the country and in California. And we're also, um, it's, I'm, I'm actually very mournful and crestfallen this week. Uh, there's like multiple losses of life in multiple arts communities from uh, uh, O'Shea, the dancer who just uh, was, was killed in a hate crime in Brooklyn and New York, um, uh, Sinead O'Connor, Paul Rubens, and um, uh, heartbreaking news out of California with um, Angus Cloud. I mean, we, we need each other. We really, really need each other in all kinds of ways. And um, yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry. That's going to. I didn't mean to drift, but you know our work is actually rather urgent, and this, this show covers um, many areas of public concern that are that are not always uh, they're not particularly happy actually, um, and that's a part of our layered experience. Um, I think that's actually along the lines of what I'm asking, in the sense that um, it, as you can see in the exhibition, you've never shied from addressing. I don't even want to say difficult subject matter. I would just say the way society operates. Um, and, uh, and you've used historical precedent to help us understand the present. Um, so for example, using, looking at court cases um, going back to the 60s um, that were landmark court cases in the process of desegregating um, public schools in the United States. And looking at, for example, that historical precedent in juxtaposition with say something that happened just a few years ago, you know, acts of violence that are in recent memory so along the lines of those um, hate crimes that you're mentioning that happened within a matter of hours yesterday. ago. Yeah, yesterday. So there's something at stake at pulling past with present, but I think because it's easy to focus only on the subject matter of your artworks, which is layered and dense, I wanted to also create space to talk about the artistic and formal decisions in when you're looking at the depth and the scope of this subject matter, which is basically tracking the course of American history, right? Like what kind of country are we living in? What have we, where have we lived? There's this decision to use layering and collage. And so I wanted to um, probe that with you. you know, You're so good. 
You're so good. <laughs> You're like literally the best. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, collage and layering. I mean, I guess um, um, printmaking. I learned about printmaking because I got to go to art school. I got to go to art school because there was a, a history of uh, full scholarship tradition at the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art for uh, the School of Art, the School of Architecture, and the School of Engineering. And I was able to get there because I had uh, I got I got to go to a magnet school for the arts in high school. You know, so this is actually this is this is all my first language. You know, visual art is my first language, and and moving around inside of the space is, is is my most natural inclination. And then these narratives, these narratives of public space that just happen to have so much to do with uh, resistance to violence and oppression are, well, I consider it largely an imposition. Um, I consider racism and misogyny and, uh, and uh, anti-gay hate, I, I consider that all to be an imposition on my reality. My, com my compulsion is to, is to make imagery and I was lucky enough to have communities around me of working artists who identified that and encouraged that. So I ended up at art school in New York and, um, and I, wanted, I was afraid that I, wasn't, I wouldn't make it as a painter because New York was so intimidating. And I did what a lot of us do, which is, you know, try to imagine myself as a graphic designer because they seem to always have work. Um, but I, I, it didn't fit. It wasn't a fit for me. And I found that um, even after years and years of learning and relearning Photoshop um, in every school that I've been at, because Photoshop was always evolving. Um, and I was in high school. I'm from the before times. Um, and, and I was in high school in the late 90s when Adobe was just beginning and we were at, like their first experiments, you know. <laughs> Um, the before times. The before times, yeah. <laughs> That's true. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I tried again and it didn't, it, I, I, found that, I found that I had some friends who were, like the current dean of the School of Art at, at Cooper Union was a brilliant, brilliant young graphic designer who came out of that school who just like, you know, took to the keyboard like, you know, that's his palette. And I wanted, to, I wanted that to happen for me because he went there with nothing, like grew up in a trailer and like, you know, graduated taking care of his parents in Texas and living in an apartment, and, you know what I mean? Like he, he was one of those stories. And um, yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't my experience when I sat down in front of that keyboard, but I did find, I found myself very confused about the um, expectation of outcomes in the digital world and the language that was being used. But I did start art school at the San Francisco Art Institute where I studied um, uh, experimental film and video, six, six and eight millimeter film, where we cut and pasted in base, in like editing base, you know, by hand. Um, and so the kind of the same thing happened with relearning Photoshop. When I left that graphic design class, you know, understanding that that was not my special calling, but I went upstairs, my, my, I went up that second semester of my second year, I went upstairs to where the print shop, where the printmaking floor is, where photo is across, the, across from silk screen and lithography and um, uh, copper and all those things, you know, these traditional um, methodologies. I found that I understood what I was supposed to do, and I had like I had masters, you know, print shop masters who guided me. I my, I understand this world physically. I didn't understand it digitally. I had to under I had to learn it physically, and that's where I found uh, myself up becoming obsessed with the idea that the halftone line can translate a moment of history, a photograph. Uh, you know, that the halftone line can turn an image back into a drawing or back into a tool for drawing, back into a tool for painting. And, um, and so inside of that world of like disciplinary, questioning disciplinary boundaries, I, I really got excited, you know? So I was like, if I turn this halftone line, if I turn this, how can I turn this halftone line? How, how can a painting push the boundaries of printmaking? How can printmaking push the boundaries of sculpture? You know, what makes a painting a painting? Is it because it's bound to the wall? You know, what are traditions of, what are art historical traditions of painting that I'm learning about, relearning about, immersed in? Um, if it, if it, if, if I think about Christopher Wilmarth and I make this wall bound thing that comes out of the wall, is it, is it now a sculpture? Um, will the body feel like it's a sculpture? Will the body of the viewer implicated in its presence uh, spatially? You know, like, will, will we start to have different experiences of it by, by way of its, you know, those, those of us who are sighted, by way of its texture and um, its relationship to the wall? I don't know. So, you know, so then I, then I started to get free. And I think I keep making these rules, like this is the room where there are all these rules about the geometry of the pieces that start to get broken here and the work about the, the Great Society. 
And then the, the newer pieces d dedicated to Colorado on the other side um, continue to break out further. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm looking for uh, looking for guidance when I'm making the work. And so there are these moments when um, there were these years when uh, responding to I thought my job was going to be to respond to the geometry that's defined by the placement of the bag handles and the embedding of uh, voting ephemera. These works that are about um, uh, suffrage. Uh, but um, you know, ultimately, I think I keep coming back to this place maybe like every seven years or so. Um, where I'm, I'm, I'm questioning my behavior and I'm questioning my compulsions and I'm trying to, you know, reevaluate and get free. And I remember starting to ask those questions when I was like seven, you know, like what am I doing and why? You know, is this, is this gonna matter art historically or is this to comfort me? And um, I guess I'm getting more and more okay to, you know, with a little bit of both, you know, like that it's, it's okay because sometimes I've been very hard, you know, the, the years that I was working with public artists which I appreciate that we acknowledge in the wall didactics that public artists really, in California, really um, nourished me and influenced me and made me, for a while, feel like I was, when I got to New York, I felt like I was ruined because, um, because I couldn't, I kept feeling like, you know, I'm in these, in, the, in these crits with these kids and, you know, I'm like, I've been out of school for seven years working and I'm like one of six transfer students and it was great. Um, some of my best friends have come out of that situation and, and they show up in, in a lot of these works, but at the time, you know, New York is New York. It's, you know, it's, it's the center of the contemporary art world as we understand it. And, one, well, you know, as we understood it. I mean, art historically. You know, art, I mean, it's New, it's New York. It's New York, it's New York. It is what it is. Well. It's, the, it's what it is. As painters, as visual, look, look we, can, we can, you know, we can go there. But, um, I'm just saying, like the way the way that we learned about art on the on the West Coast, the way that I learned about art, being immersed in visual art on the West Coast was very was very different. You know, it was just you know I'm learning about Barbara Kruger and I'm Siqueiros Orozco Rivera. You know, I'm, lear I'm learning a different tradition of um, of, of history and of of, of, of avant artists in San Francisco before the tech bro um, ethnic cleansing. You know, it's just it's just I was there for that. I was there for that. Um, you know, we studied film, we made film and we studied film, you know, like that was, it was, San Francisco had a very distinct history about this. Anyway, so the East Coast is a different spatial history and a lot of people were really devoted to the white cube and to the gallery and I still felt uh, a calling or a responsibility to public space. So there was something about printmaking that really got me excited about the history of artists being involved in public space through publication um, and through taking these you know, blacksmith, you know, like taking these machines that are, that are meant for producing newspapers, that are meant for educating the, you know, the 95 Theses changes everything I learned in Catholic school, you know, like, so to, when, when artists throughout our, our generations of making have taken these machines that are meant for one thing and then turn them into something else, um, it just, you know, that's what I get excited about. Um, I don't know. Sorry, I don't even know if that answered the question. No, it did, it did. Thank you, thank you. Um, so, <laughs> she accepts me. That's my parents. <laughs> um, so I want to stay for a minute on the idea of painting. Um, and to me, it feels incredible to be sitting here with you talking about painting because I remember, gosh, in the early aughts, I was actually on a panel that talked about the death of painting, and I was the lone voice saying, I don't know what you all are talking about. Like, painting is going to survive this. It's alive and well. Um, and yet, at the same time, I question why I feel attached to the, the, the word painting and why, um, and why painting still has this enduring power. And I, and I mentioned this to you, um, you also feel attached to the word painting, even though um, so much of what your work resists a traditional definition of what a painting is. And this, uh, this gallery is actually a great example of that because um, you have these beautiful, unique to you, awning stretcher bars um, that are essentially triangular shaped stretchers that push the, push the painting forward. Um, if you go through the show, you'll see actual awnings uh, from buildings that were the, you know, in a way, prelude, the prelude to this innovation. Um, you also have works that, the, you know, the, the backing is our paper, brown paper bags, right? So like those handles that you're seeing um, around the edges of the work are from bound paper bags, like arguably one of the most um, humble, accessible materials that anyone could find anywhere. 
Um, and then we have canvas, and then we have PVC vinyl, and then we have halftone lines that relate to printmaking. Um, and then we also have these optic, well, and then I should say, and then we have an election ephemera, ephemera from the workings of democracy. We also have soil. Um, so um, if you haven't realized by now, so many of Tamashi's paintings respond to very specific places. So in this room alone, we have works that are responding to Ohio, and they have soil from the Underground Railroad in Ohio. That's this painting and the painting on the back wall that were created for the Wexner, responding, uh, which is based in Columbus, Ohio, responding to the voting history of Ohio. We have paintings from the parish, uh, responding to the, the working class uh, people of color working in Southampton, with soil from Southampton, and with wampum dust from Southampton. And then in these works here, about the great society, about democratic advancement, we have uh, marble dust from Colorado, from the very same quarry that sourced the marble that creates the Lincoln Memorial. Basically, the site of pilgrimage for so many of us that go to Washington, D.C., we visit the Lincoln Memorial as this homage um, to emancipation and to freedom and the, the aspiration of what America is. So we have all these materials going on. And we're still talking about these things in the context of painting. And, and we also have video that you put in relationship to painting and that you think of as moving paintings. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, so I, I, I feel like this, it's a word we're both actually attached to. We're emotionally tethered to this idea of painting. And I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, sure. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, you, gosh, I just love you so much, Miranda. <laughs> Um, and I'm honored that for the next few years I get to, I get, still get to be We're gonna do this again. artist. We're gonna do this again. And oh, again. this is not my mouth, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, painting, um, I guess I'm still trying to figure that out. I, I love painting. I just love painting. I mean, I, I, I used to climb scaffolding and get over fear of heights for painting. Um, painting is intimidating. Painting is a bar that I wanted to meet and participate in. Um, I remember uh, the, the arts, the, the, um, the magnet school for performing and visual arts that I went to in Los Angeles. Um, as we had an elementary school and then I guess, you know, what was still then considered like the middle school when people start taking uh, multiple classes when they leave, when we're not just in one classroom for the day and have to start changing periods and stuff. And um, I remember uh, making my argument to uh, the advanced art teacher for the sixth and the seventh graders why I should be allowed to stay after school um, to join their class because we got out of school at like three in the or like two and then the upper class kids got out of school at like three thirty or something like that and you know instead of like playing on the yard for you know stinking for another couple of hours I was like I should be I'm like looking, I'm looking in the window and seeing what they're doing. They're studying Frida Kahlo and doing all this stuff. And I was like, I should be in there, you know? But they're like, you're too young. So, um, you know, I remember making that, that, that uh, making my case to join that class as a fifth grader or as a sixth grader and, um, and, and being really afraid of painting. You know, like a lot of kids were, everybody was really into um, uh, comic books. So, you know, drawing is the, drawing is the beginning of everything for all of us, we all have the compulsion to make a picture before we understand pictograms as language, whatever language is being spoken in our house or in our communities, we all have the urge to make the mark. Um, but I remember then like starting to identify the difference between painting and drawing and really, you know, not knowing if I had it in me, you know, I was like, I don't, this is really tough, you know, like to, to, to and then like learning about, you know, wet on wet, dry on wet, you know, like with a watercolor. So just like learning about these different um, material relationships that happen between a dry surface, a two-dimensional surface, wet media, a tool, maybe the tool is your finger, maybe the tool is a brush, um, and then the magic that happens, you know, oh God, and then there's the issue of control. Like, are you gonna control everything or is it gonna be purely expressive? Uh, Josef Albers, you know, makes his argument that, you know, the, the purpose of our work is not to express, but is to um, uh, um, uh, form follows function. Um, so there are all these arguments, you know, there are all these arguments by artists that I respect, um, I've grown to respect over the years about, like, the purpose, you know, we have Frida Kahlo, body completely battered, 
painting on her back in a bed, you know, like, uh, so like, you know, there's the purpose that fulfills the soul. There's a purpose that like answers compulsive visual questions that we have, you know, painting is just, painting is the, painting is it. I mean, painting, I, I'm from Los Angeles. So I grew up, I grew up when we still had all of our, you know, mural, Los Angeles hosted the, the Olympics twice in one decade. I don't even understand how that happens. And there's people here, there's people, there's city planning people here, Ellen, Katina, you know what I mean? Like y'all know, I mean, that's, a, that's huge. I don't even know how that happened. And, um, but we had all of these murals back then to, to, to wash a city, um, to prepare for the Olympics. Back then in the 80s meant like painting everywhere. So I grew up with all of these fresh paintings everywhere everywhere on top of the historic Chicano murals and the black community painted murals that, that had been coming up through the 70s. Um, it, was, it was the way that painting was communicated. I mean, Kent Twitchell, if anybody remembers Los Angeles in the 80s and 90s, we had um, the, the LA Marathon murals, the murals through the freeways, you know? Like, so I knew, I understood the city I grew up in based on the paintings, where they were. Um, in, in the transit as we drove everywhere to get me to school and get my mother to work. So painting was essential to my understanding of space. Um, so yeah, it's just what I, it's just kind of like what I believe in and I don't always, I'm not, you know, now it's just kind of, it just feels like I'm so, something I'm supposed to do. I don't, and, and when I don't understand what I'm doing, painting always shows back up to tell me. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't even remember how I did most of this anymore, but like, <laughs> You know, like, like, but the washing, you know, like my, my Helen Frankenthaler problems. How am I gonna, so I know I wanna use a color. How am I gonna assert that color on this surface? Um, what did Helen Frankenthaler do? Um, you know, what did Jack Whitten do? You know, what did, um, you know, what did Robert Reed do? What is Robert Nava doing? You know, how is Eric Mack reconsidering painting through textile, you know? Um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, well, let's talk about the, <laughs> let's talk. I really don't know. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> Um, we should talk about the relativity of color because yeah. it is something that you explore in your paintings. So, I mean, I remember being next to you uh, at Tilton Gallery where you were talking about, I was exploring what to do with this white and this green and how that relationship, the relationship of color, one deeply affects the other. And one of the breakthroughs that, that was I... Exciting. <clears throat> that was This one was really fun to make. Um, and uh, But I remember one of the breakthroughs that I, was one of the introductions that I had to your practice and what many of us had, you know, that when you were um, get, starting to gather press and momentum around your career was this breakthrough you had where you said, or you're, I'm sorry, you said through your work, let's examine the relativity of color in painting. So in other words, how one color in painting can affect another and compare that in juxtaposition to how skin color and definitions of race have been talked about in the United States of America. So in other words, the relativity of color and actually the work of Thurgood Marshall in unwinding this concept that race and color were absolute, right? They were societal constructs that are defined by juxtaposition. And you were really the first Tamashi because she was like, how are you gonna canonize? No, how are you gonna situate me canonically? And I was like, well, I think to, um, pull these two threads, one which in my art historical upbringing has always existed within the formal realm, how we talk about color in the, in the red, green, blue, very strict formal sense. And then how do we talk about color in society? And I really would credit you, Tamashi, for being the first, if, if, to my knowledge, to bring these two in direct juxtaposition, right? And using historical context to do so. So we should talk about it. We should talk about the relativity of color, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah um, thanks. So, you know, something I love about Miranda is uh, she's, a, she's, a, she's a quiet sleeper hit. You just like, <laughs> I don't even understand. <laughs> like, you look so youthful and you like are this like, uh, you hold all of this uh, art historical and curatorial knowledge and understanding from your commitment to the community. And you've like, you quietly, so what I was trying to tell y'all is this show is gonna travel. Amen Orejiron's show is traveling now. Uh, she's co-curating uh, Prospect, uh, I know this is not what she wants me to do. She's co-curating Prospect uh, New Orleans. Uh, she and Nora um, here at MCA Denver have co-curated the next show that will happen, which is a group show called Cowboy. Um, 
And uh, so this will, be, this will be the last solo project for the next like, couple of years. You're my curator and I'm your artist like, for the next couple of years. And um, with two books and two shows traveling, and I just don't know how you do it. You're amazing. Sorry, I veered again. Sorry, this is not I how I normally again. talk. <laughs> I veered thank again. You, but, uh, what, but this is about you, doing? Oh, canonically. So, yeah. So, like, I, when I, I told her what I, I wanted, I wanted her to tell me some things that I don't know because, because you hold so much, like, your viewpoint is different. Mine is in the studio and yours is, his, yours is, is historically different from your vantage point. So, thank you for um, giving that to me. Thank you for um, helping me to see myself um, art historically. It's, it's like literally my wildest dream come true. Um, so, that identification that there is, um, when I was a student at Yale, uh, my best friend Nia, which you know, y'all know, y you who like tolerate me know that I'm always talking about Nia, but she's my muse um, and she's a policy wonk. And uh, when I went to Cooper Union downtown, she was at Columbia Teachers College uptown uh, focusing on education policy with a focus on leadership and law. And um, now she's focused on economic development, but she's the person who like hooks me. She's the one who indulges my questions for like the last 20 years and, and she works in coalition with so many amazing people and at the time when I was getting ready to go to Yale, she was the executive director of the NAACP Boston branch working in coalition with other entities to try to save what was left of yellow school bus service and that's when I started to understand back at home in our dining room table covered in all of her uh, collected reading materials from her teacher's college days which happened to be at the same time as the 50th anniversary of Brown she started to help me understand that what we were seeing is a multi-generational ideological force to undo all of the gains made from Brown and all the great society legislation. Because I'm a beneficiary who wasn't, um, I wasn't, it, these, these gains were not historicized for me as something that, that still needed to be defended. So I didn't really understand what I was seeing in these hearings in Boston City Hall. I was really aghast. And at the time, after MIT, I became a nanny for three uh, European families, a British family, um, a German family, an Indo-Canadian family. And so to hear these people speak, uh, to hear these people like in city government, like rationalize making children less safe, getting them to and from school, was just bizarre, because I was like, you would never do that to your children, you would hire me. And if I had children, I wouldn't be looking after my children, because I'd be looking after yours. And I fully understand that if anything happens to this German child, British child, or this Indo-Canadian child, while they're in my care, my life is over. So how can you all casually just talk about like robbing the public school children and their families of yellow school bus service when there are not fully resourced schools in their neighborhoods. They still have to travel like it's the 1940s to get to a well-resourced school. And in Boston, you have to get to a, an exam school if you expect your child to go to college. So like, I didn't understand any of that, but I'm, I'm following her to these hearings and I'm starting to see it and I'm shocked. So she, she and her coalition start to help me understand that I don't know anything about Brown and that Brown is not singular. That's when I started to understand that Brown wasn't singular, but there was a, a collection of cases before the Supreme Court case. And the lead case was the Topeka case because they were little children. The charge, the expectation, or the experiment with the LDF was to, to challenge the American people to be a little less hateful to children. But the real, the real power cases were all collegiate. I didn't know any of that. So when I, start, when, I did, when I secretly applied to Yale, much to the chagrin of my best friend, because I'd started, I'd started making paintings again about domestic workers, myself as a domestic worker, and other domestic workers in Cambridge, and then I had all these paintings in my bedroom, and once again, painting shows up to tell me what I need to do, because I'm like, what am I supposed to do? And painting is like, well, you need to be with people who take painting seriously, so I only wanted to be at Yale for that. And um, I ended up there with access to a law school, and um, spent time in the law library checking out books that like were dusty. Literally, nobody cared about this history. Nobody cared about it. The, I didn't have to fight anybody. You know, I didn't have to bring the books back because they were being called upon by anybody else. They stayed in my studio for two years. Nobody cared about the history. And so I'm, I'm reading this case law and uh, relearning interaction of color um, with Anoka Faruqi and then, uh, and then Screen Space with uh, Sarah Oppenheimer, and we're reading Interaction of Color line by line, and I start to see... Uh, Joseph Albers. Yeah. yeah, by Joseph Albers, 1964, Joseph Albers. Um, uh, who's the, you know, the, 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 the Jewish runaway. He and Ani Albers on the run from, from uh, Nazism. You know, they lose the Bauhaus, they run, they come here, and like so many other Jewish immigrants, find themselves in the hotbed of the originator 
of the concept of displacing and um, dehumanizing and, ex and exterminating people. Um, there's a really great book called Hitler's American Model that was published out of Princeton University Press a few years ago that's incredibly easy to get that documents um, the Third Reich's um, inspiration being the United States for what ends up becoming understood as the world's greatest um, uh, disaster. So, you know, you have all of these brilliant minds who escape and they come here and they become embedded in learning communities uh, and they're faced with uh, American segregation. So, you know, Joseph Albers in teaching at Black Mountain College illegally taught uh, Jacob Lawrence. Um, and then he ends up at Yale and recreates that school of art into what it becomes historically you know, it's the oldest school of art in the country, but he, everything changes after that with his model. Um, and his teaching model ends up touching all of us, all of us everywhere, all of us who were children who were learning art in, um, in the United States in, the, in, the, in what becomes the 60s, the 70s, and 80s. Everybody emulates this model. So when I, I'm reintroduced to interaction of color as a grown person, not as like a wild undergrad, but as a grown person, I am able to recognize like, oh, I understand this. This is because my art teachers in Los Angeles were recommunicating this. This is the drawing from the left side of the brain. Like all of this is coming from the Albers model, actually. And so I'm reading this language and I start to see a correlation in, in uh, Thurgood Marshall's language and in the language that I'm seeing in these uh, tra court transcripts and this, this description of color um, and the boundaries of color and the optical illusions, you know, that color, uh, you know, color is only, um, a color is only what we think it is based on what's nearest its border. And that color is not static. You know, the way that Albers talks about the way that one person sees the red of a Coca-Cola label is not the same um, because we're not seeing them in the same context. And that's, I had this big aha at that moment. I was like, doesn't everybody see this? Like, you know, so, so my thesis becomes, you know, about the, by the time I, I'm leaving Yale, my, the, I'm able to articulate the project as, um, um, the color perception, the work sought to um, visualize and explore the perception of color and its impact on the value of life, human life, in public space. Color, the per color perception and its impact on the value of life in public space. Because while I'm studying that, this is 2014 to 2016, it's just death after death of black child after black child after black child after black child with no consequences, remorseless, remorseless state violence, vigilante violence, and it's um, just really just like startling to the soul. And, um, and I'm seeing, you know, I'm at, and I only went there to try to visualize the legislative history of Brown v. Board of Education. And in doing so, you know, I had this other aha about transportation, that it was the Plessy versus Ferguson case that Brown overturns, which was a transportation case. And then in Boston, you know, the, the, the fiery battle is over school transportation. Um, and you know, there's this uh, there's this paper that came out. I know this is ridiculous. I'm dragging on, but I, I, there's this paper that was written by the American Psychological Society in 2014 called um, "The Essence of Innocence: Consequences for Dehumanizing Black Children," and it's a white paper that you know, like with focus groups and stuff about um, the association, the common association with, of images of black children with animals, and um, and you know, like people who were studied are cops you know, no, civilians and police, because it identifies the overuse of violence in response to interactions with black children. So, you know, this transportation, safety, access to education, and uh, the children of color's bodies as uh, sites um, of like either being considered human or not being considered human based on how color is perceived. So I just started to, I just saw it, I just saw it. Yeah. Um, and um, I don't know, I just saw it. Yeah, well, in one of the galleries, um, the second gallery that people encounter is called Vibrating Boundaries, which is a phrase from Joseph Albers that mm -hmm. talks about essentially when two colors are in high contrast, the eye struggles in a way to reconcile it. You know, there, they, there's an optical, you know, vibration that occurs mm -hmm. uh, where the eye, the eye is struggling to reconcile things yeah. in high contrast. What blue does with red, why, we, why, mm -hmm. why uh, 3D glasses are the way they are. I bet Matt Murray could explain this completely. Um, uh, uh, orange and blue create a shadow. Mm -hmm. Red and blue create a, a, a light, a white light. All mm -hmm. these things that, were, that are not actually there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So then, so Tamashi, then you come to Colorado and you spend a summer 
here. Well, I, I should. I'm really fast forwarding here, but yeah, we like, are. Cause I, I'm she, really. She did want. I'm sorry, I did too much because she wanted yeah. to talk about vibrating boundaries, which is the video piece in gallery number two mm -hmm. um, that I made in Texas in summer 2015. Um, that becomes an homage to the experiences of black women and girls at the hands of uh, police and police adjacent violence. Um, uh, uh, that concludes with Sandra Bland and her uh, being um, uh, toppled and snatched from her car and hogtied and taken into custody by Officer Brian Insinia in front of um, her alma mater, uh, Prairie View College, which was a place that I intended to go and seek access to their archives until I found out what happened to her. And then I concluded it was not safe for me to do that. So Project Row Houses, the people at Project Row Houses were kind enough to let me borrow a hot row house for the summer where I conducted these experiments. But my purpose in being in the third ward was actually to try to visualize Thurgood Marshall's route since that was his like space where he fought what becomes he worked with community to, to fight and win what becomes the first successful case of school desegregation, Sweat versus Painter in 1949. Um, but it, you know, the project kind of changed based on the level of violence that black women and girls were being met with that summer. Um, and I, I knitted this color study that the, main, the two main opposing colors were orange and blue. And I worked with two um, really brilliant artists, Emily Peacock and Patrick Renner, who were uh, white people. Um, and brilliant artists and uh, people I respect very much who helped me um, engage in uh, stress positions. We, we wrapped ourselves in the color study um, and, and uh, occupied the stress positions that we all saw these black women and girls endure that summer for one minute at a time on hot concrete in the sun. Um, and so that's what that video collage becomes. It, be, it starts with a, a, a woman, Naima Jackson, reading from Interaction of Color to her children. In a, in a situation that I set up for them, and then it goes into the stress positions that um, painter Josephine Halverson helped me understand art historically as tableau vivant, mm -hmm. um, where we hold a position as if you know we are living photographs of a moment. Yeah, um, yeah but that's what happened. Yeah, no, and there's some careful sensitivity, and we, we talked about it a lot, actually, about what it means to share this subject matter, which is, you know, yeah both simultaneously um, part of our history, something that merits being made aware of, and yet at the same time is very difficult um, yeah. to take in. Yeah, and, the, um, and you started off with the audio collage. I mean, that was my, making that piece was the first time I heard the audio of what it sounded like when they took her. And, um, and that, you know, we worked really hard with uh, the gallery attendants to try to figure out the right level, the right frequency for that sound uh, without silencing it. It's really, it's funny how like the, the, the sound of this uh, like ongoing horror is so discomforting that our compulsion is to silence it so that, because you know, no one, no one wants to hurt anyone else in here. Um, and still like that is, that is the fact of how, how and where we live today is that reality. And, and I'm very aware that that could happen to me at any moment. Yeah. I, don't, I, you don't have to, I don't have to be doing anything wrong. I don't have to be doing anything wrong. So, um, and then again, I, I apologize, we're gonna jump around a little bit, but I do wanna make sure we leave time for questions. Oh so, yeah. So I'm gonna actually do um, a hard pivot right now and talk about your work, which spans, I, I would, you know, really, you know, sensitive and difficult subject matter, all the way to Tommy tonight, which is on the lower level of the- How many of you have been in the video room? How many of you? Have you okay. okay. So, I'm watching y'all. Um, <laughs> You four, I see you. <laughs> so um, when I met Tamashi, she, Tommy Tonight had been born, but Tommy Tonight was on the precipice of having many more adventures. And, um, and I remember thinking how extraordinary it was that there was this artist who does this very historically rich, layered material, deeply engaged with the history of painting and you know, um, uh, American trajectory, but, and also embodied Tommy Tonight, who is a persona, I would, would you, we're, yeah. yeah. We're still trying to figure that yeah, out. Yeah, we're still trying to figure this out. Um, who is free, joyous, amorous, uh, uses the language of 90s R&B and hip hop uh, to convey love, emotion, um, and, uh, and where operates through the, um, through the format of a music video, essentially. Mm -hmm. So when I met Tamashi, you, Tam uh, Tommy had been born in- uh, At Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. At Skowhegan. Yeah. Um, Strange things happen yeah. in the woods of Maine. Yeah. And John. 
amongst other artists. Other young artists who should be applying to Skowhegan yeah. every year. You never know how you're going to come out. And uh, yeah, and born in community with other artists, which yeah. I think is relevant to mention. And uh, he was he was making beauty, uh, videos in Greece. Uh, I remember like watching uh, Tommy Tonight in action making videos in Greece with other Greek Greek artists, um, yeah. and also made made a video in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's actually been incredible for me to watch visitors come from this material here and under and actually snap to the connections with what's going on in the lower level. Yeah. Um, Your hypothesis was correct, right. brilliant well, curator. I didn't know how I that was gonna pan out. I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I would not have done what she did, which is why I'm not the curator. I wouldn't have done it. But, uh, but I mean, I, I stand by the decision. I think it's actually really important to see this space of liberation and, um, and also to acknowledge you're doing new work with Tommy tonight um, that will debut in Los Angeles this fall. So yeah. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what Tommy means to you, and um, and also, you know, you you're 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 continuing to make work as Tommy. So if we could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just something that happened. Uh, there's a really great book called, uh, from my uh, a big show that we did at the Newberger Museum of uh, of Art at uh, SUNY Purchase called Slow Jams. It's ten years of my video experimental work. And uh, we produced a very, my first hardcover, knock knock, my first hardcover cover, cover catalog. And in it is a conversation with art historian and curator Rebecca Uchil called Lip Sync, in which she really prized from me the uh, origins of Tommy Tonight, um, which was really born out of um, anticipatory grief. I understand that now that my mother has died. Um, uh, when I was in, uh, at Skowhegan, there was an earthquake in Southern California, and um, uh, um, a brilliant artist named uh, uh, Sharif, um, who's from Encino, Sh Sharif Farad, um, chased me down in a, in a cow pasture to tell me that I should call and check on my people because there had been an earthquake. And in, L in Southern California, you never know, Southern, in California, you just never know how bad it's actually going to be, you know? It's like, it seems like it's not a big deal when they're little tremors and then, you know, Loma Prieta happens. You know, so, um, and I'm all the way, we're all the way, like, up and away. I have no idea. We have no idea, you know, what level of damage has been done or who's been hurt. So I called my mother, and it was on that call that I found out that she had moved to Bakersfield, which is, like, in the center, in the Central Valley. It's very agricultural and not historically a place where my people have been, and it's uh, really isolated. If you don't already have people there, it's an isolated place. And I was worried. You know, I became very worried. And, um, and I became depressed. Um, and, I be and I felt like, um, you know, I'm at this dreamy place that, you know, people who are kind of like low-key competitively <laughs> involved in visual arts, you know, it's like, you know, we have to apply for things, and I've applied like seven times. And I finally get there, and there's like literally brilliant artists like frolicking in fields. Like it's a it's a dream, you know. And it's a and it's a residency space that was created by artists in the in the what is it, the six the four the forties started in the forties, um, as a space to be free from American war fever. You know, it's like it's a historically dreamy. Uh, Jacob Lawrence was one of the original artist residents there. You know, it's like it's a dreamy place to be art historically, and I could not escape. Um, my sadness around not being able to control um, decisions of people that I love. I don't know, I guess to be like general, I guess, you know, that we all have this experience, I imagine. You know, we love people and they do things we don't think they should do. And um, I became really sad and I was gonna be really emo about it and I was gonna sit in my cabin and listen to, um, listen to uh, uh, bell hooks talks and, <laughs> Latoya Ruby Frazier talks, because when you're there, John, you have access to all of the recorded lectures that have ever happened there. Um, so I was like, I'm not gonna hang out, I'm not gonna go to any parties, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna sit and listen to Bell Hooks talking after she broke her leg walking down a hill, and that's all, I'm just gonna live to it over and over again, all by myself. And then um, it turns out there was a party happening that night that I'd forgotten about that was a drag party. And who knew, who knew that it would be a, the, transgre the political transgression that it is now, you know? Like when we were planning this, when we were planning this show and Miranda was like, Tommy is gonna have a room all his own. And I'm like, are people really gonna even understand that, you know? She's like, yes. 
it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, like it's gonna happen. And I you said know, it just like that. Yeah, she did. <laughs> but by the time we hung the, by the time we mounted the show, uh, you know, the the drag ban had happened in Tennessee. You know, so it's like, like kind of like, uh, so, you know, so this 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 spot of liberation, what became like this freeing moment where I got to be somewhere, someone else for the night, where I got to be, I got to embody. Just, I just got to take a break, which I didn't understand until talking to this art historian. I was like, oh shit, that's what happened. I'm sorry, oh shoot, that's what happened. Oh heck. Um, you know, I was like super worried. I was just super worried. It was consumed by worry. And then when I saw everybody getting dressed up for the night, I didn't want to miss out. And a brilliant Texas artist named Ariel Renee Jackson painted a beard and a mustache on me and like a new person was born just for that night. And, um, and he just he became this embodiment of like all the R&B love songs that I, that I know better than I know multiplication tables. <laughs> and, um, and me and three other black women artists were all dressed up and we were this crew of fellas for the night. And then, and then we decided to perform for a talent show, you know, later, because you get, we stay up there for nine weeks, you know, we stay up there for nine weeks. So like a couple of weeks later we were performing and then we were asked to perform for the convocation, you know, the big, <laughs> Con, you know, the, the ending event, and we created um, uh, this uh, music video that's showing downstairs, you four. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, it, just, it just kind of happened. And then when we were in Greece, I remember feeling kind of just like being, having the space to search my feelings, and I felt compelled to make music videos as Tommy, um, you know, with the Parthenon as a backdrop. Um, I don't really, it's not, a, it's not a space that I know or am, I feel fully responsible for formally. It was, it's just like, it's just something I felt compelled to do. And, um, you know, I'm really serious about my responsibility to painting. And then, and then this character has come up and complicated that. Um, so before I open it up, I do want to mention that there are three new paintings that were created yeah. um, in response to your time here in Colorado. And mm -hmm. they are actually on the other, if you go around you this haven't corner. Been there yet. Um, they're, they're my favorites. Thank, thank you for saying a, that. Thank you. I, you say that to, to all your mother. museums. Not to be yeah. a bad mother. <laughs> Um, but uh, there's this um, beautiful work responding to um, Boulder mm -hmm. um, and uh, based off a documentary called This Is Not Who We Are, yeah. also supported by the Scintilla Foundation. There is a thread here. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I do want to acknowledge actually um, the openness of those paintings from a formal perspective. They're still layering, but the color pal palette has changed. They're, they have this um, sort of bold, open feeling to them, in my perspective. Um, and uh, but also, you know, and also for the first time, noticing that whereas you have these vinyl strips uh, with images embedded, it was the f one of the first times, other than this set we were looking at right here, where the vinyl strips tell a story across several paintings. Yeah. And they're large paintings, and they're dealing with stories about Black life and Boulder. Yeah, Black life and self determination. You know. What were y'all thinking? Does that, that exist? exist. Go, go yes, it. stop take, it. Take it away. You better stop. Some, some people are going to be coming for you. Um, <laughs> we're screening the film at the Holiday Theater on August 31st. So you go there, and then you, will, you, you can be a part of that discussion there. there it's, it's a very, very rich history from the, from the origins of Boulder. Um, but uh, uh, I, should, I should add architecturally that these pieces, other people have picked this up. Y'all have probably picked it up. But the awnings. The awnings and the vinyl strips become uh, um, uh, like, a, like a tools for me imaginatively and then eventually actualized thanks to my family at Tilton Gallery um, indulging these, these things we've been trying to push for the last however many years. Uh, being in a walking city, being, being from California and moving to New York and noticing in my walking life awnings everywhere and awnings as an extension of uh, brick and mortar architecture that protects people. Um, and then the vinyl strips, seeing them at bodegas, in refrigerated sections at bodegas, and also in warehouses, and wondering how these big hanging things that are related to the interior and the, and like the, the exterior of architecture, how I can employ them uh, for, using, for image making the same way that my teachers taught me how to employ the whole faces of buildings themselves. Um, so yeah, there's that. Um, yeah, and so the, the paintings around the corner are a continuation of this experiment with using, um, using awnings as an inspiration for structures for painting. And the film inspired me to make these, actually there's, there's three here, there's five new paintings that are inspired by 
this film about black life in Boulder and beyond. Um, and I wanted, to, I wanted to focus on sites of self-determination and joy. You know, like so much of public space, the more I dig into narratives are really horrific. And um, something that I appreciated about learning about um, uh, people here in Colorado over many generations are these, you know, moments of creating freedom schools, uh, identifying the church as the site for community and self-determination and joy, lifting of voices. Um, uh, the classrooms, you know, when, when black people become professors, you know, CU Boulder is like, a, like, the, like the spot historically over many generations. So like, you know, taking, seeing images of students um, having these discussions in the 70s um, and, and students demonstrating in the 90s, um, most, mostly at CU Boulder. And um, uh, luckily the Scintilla Foundation was kind enough to put me in contact with the filmmakers. Um, uh, Barrett and John and Kat uh, Katrina, and they uh, helped me and, and Florence Blackwell um, uh, uh, do uh, image research that ends up becoming the inspirations for those paintings. And then finally, something else that I learned at Skowhegan um, and from Josephine Halverson um, is that uh, before, we, before the polymer revolution, before uh, acrylic paint becomes available, um, historically, paintings surfaces were primed with marble dust, and animal skin glue as a binder. Um, so finding myself, you know, having been like reluctant to accept that painting was only on canvas or only one thing, I was like really rebellious. From 16 onward, I had issues with like accepting painting, the surface of painting history as being what it is. I, I wanted to make something that didn't already exist. And I find myself back here, you know, really in love with um, mixing marble dust into a paste that I can, you know, make a new texture on the surface and it turns out I'm just historically consistent with every other painter who came <laughs> before me. I can't get away with it. I can't get away. So uh -huh. I love it. Okay, we're gonna stop at we're gonna that stop. For, we're gonna stop at that full full circle moment. Um, and I would love to open the floor um, to you all to ask questions of uh, Tamashi Jackson. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, thank you for tolerating this. Tamashi <laughs> Yes, so we have a mic. Oh good, there's yeah. a hand or two. Yeah. Hey John. Hey. Um, because I know John already, hold on to that John. There's that young lady all the way back there behind Matt. Do you, can we give her a mic? Do you have a mic? No. no. Okay. Yeah, I can stop that. Okay. Um, I'm curious if you thought much about any connection, just because of, you have your knitted pieces that you've used and there's embroidery on this and some of your pieces with the thread. Um, Last issue of Art in America, I encourage you to grab it. There's a great article about this group show that I got to be a part of that was curated by Legacy Russell called The New Bend, um, uh, an homage to the, the G's Bend quilters. And it's a really, really good article that talks about just that. Um, I'm, I'm just one of many artists in this in this show, but you're, you're bringing up all the stuff that is historically, um, or I'm sorry, contemporarily um, potent right now, um, but I learned how to, how to knit as a part of my recovery process after leaving MIT. Um, truly, because I was like, I was real, you know, I'm, I'm proud to say I got out with a 4.7 GPA that couldn't, it couldn't keep me down, but I completely fell apart after that, because, you know, my, my plan was actually to, to slip into traditional architecture and to be a part of creating material solutions for overabundance of plastic. That's what I thought I was supposed to do. And, um, and I ended up, you know, I was this close from going into building technology and the professor that I wanted to work with was gonna be in Singapore and I just ended up having to like reconsider what my life was supposed, or actually I had to give up what I thought was supposed to happen. And um, people in Cambridge, I just lived a very slow, very humble life um, in Cambridge and I made friends many of whom knew how to knit, like the kind of people who can knit socks with like four separate sticks and just, just amazing. And um, it was initially just something to do with my hands while I was looking after these children. 
and, um, and it was really cold. We still had very, very cold, this is not long ago, so we still had very, very cold winters in Boston. And when I was waiting for these children at their bus stops, I could never keep my neck and my head completely warm. I would wrap my head and wrap my neck, but I could never, even with a hoodie, I just couldn't stay warm. So initially, these, um, these, uh, these knitted color studies, they're just round tubes that I could keep my head and my neck warm, and that I could, I could knit and curl around my face. So like the pieces that you, the, the video collage that you see in Gallery One, which was my attempt to make a, a video operate like a painting, to make a, a video that invites the viewer to stay longer than 20 seconds. Um, the way that I saw people interact with uh, the Mark Rothko paintings at the Rothko Chapel, or the way that I feel about Barnett Newman when I'm in front of a Barnett Newman, that, you know, it's just color, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna leave but what we learn about video, when we're learning video, is that your viewer is not going to stay for more than 20 seconds. So that piece is a painting that only exists as that video with Alterance Gumby, and, and we are wrapped up in these color studies that I've knitted. And the one that Alterance is wearing was literally named after the little German child, Leo, and it was inspired by the blue, the different blues in his eyes. Um, but that's what's covering Alterance's head. It was a functional object. Um, and then when I went to school, you know, the, the immediately, you know, I thought I was never going to paint again. I accepted that maybe I would never paint. I accepted that maybe I was supposed to be a caregiver for children or something. I just accepted that. And then when I started knitting, I immediately found myself excited about what the next color was going to be and what the next color was going to be. And then I was having these feelings that made me wonder if I was knitting paintings. You know, because I was having this experience that was not just functional. I was like, ooh, you know, sitting, in the, sitting on the bus with these kids like, oh, I just can't, I just can't wait. I can't Gotta, gotta, you know, and then I'm making up rules. I'm like, okay, seven more rows, just seven more rows, and then I can go get another color. But I gotta get to these seven rows. You know, like immediately my body starts making these, starts responding to these actions with like, then you have to, and then I have to, and then I have to. And, I have to. and so I was like, oh, this kind of feels like serious. Um, so I took them with me to Yale, where I learned how to operate a studio that wasn't a bedroom or, or an office. Um, and, uh, and I took them with me there, and then I started stretching them on things and putting them on people. At first, at first my people were the, were the activators. You know, I would, I would wrap them around Alterance or Eric or, you know, eventually Mia or whoever and sit them in front of the painting. And then that way the knitted color study became a part of the painting, but the, the glue ends up being video or photography that brings them together into the same world. Um, so yeah, this, I, I, I totally feel you and there, there are people way smarter than me historically who are, who are writing, a, writing and thinking about exactly what you are too. Thank you for that. I hope that that was um, responsive. Um, John, what, what's on your mind? Well, I want to talk about, you know, I'm really interested in democracy. I run this discussion which juxtaposed with some of the European Canonically, it reminds me of what James Baldwin's reflections on domestic American policy and his experience in Paris. But then, when you reference it back to Greece, specifically, which you know, obviously has the birth of democracy, it's been such a, an interesting comparison to be looking at our domestic democracy and thinking about the birth of democracy, but also this European concept of democracy. So, maybe you could just talk about your experience in Greece a little more and how looking at that type of democracy has expanded. Um, or influence the works, especially some of the ones that we've been in position Yeah, thanks. Um, I wanted to kick this one to you, but I don't think you're going to let me do that. Um, because we were both there. Uh, you know, one of the creators of this artist residency program is, a, is an, uh, um, help me, she's, she's an artist and she's an archaeologist. And her name is Edis Plythakis. And uh, she took us through the Parthenon complex. And she, you know, she's, she's Greek American. She spent some of her early life in the United States, but she is, you know, betrothed and, and, and committed to Greece. She moved back and she never left and she knows all about it. You know, she studied archeology span and she can, she, can, she can read a rock. She can read a rock, she can read a stone. And um, so walking through the, through the Parthenon complex with her and through the Plaka with her is very different than with, uh, we learned because we, we got to overhear other people's stories and she was like, that's wrong. That's not right. 
Um, so, you know, places that stand out to me are the Tholos, the roundhouse where uh, uh, every male member of every tribe in Athens was expected at some point to be a part of the democratic process. Didn't matter if you were crazy, didn't matter if you were a debtor, didn't matter if people liked you, like everybody had to participate. I learned that the root of the word idiot, the Greek root of that word means one who thinks only of himself, idiotis. Um, who doesn't vote. And who doesn't vote, one who does not vote. Um, the last place that I got to hang out with Miranda before she left early and like literally broke my heart. I did not know her. Um, I did not know her before we started this. And by the end of it, I was like, I can't believe you're leaving. I was very pregnant. She was very pregnant. She, was, she looked like she had had a good meal when I first met her and then JoJo just like popped out. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> there's somebody, something's going on in there. Um, but before she left, we spent some time at the, the Panix, and we have a piece, one of the pieces from my first show at Night Gallery called uh, Forever My Lady, asking these very questions. You know, what's my relationship to democracy? Uh, I, actually, I thought Forever My Lady was going to be all about um, the, uh, the, the Statue of Liberty, which is famously a gift from France uh, to the United States, celebrating what was supposed to have been the abolition of slavery, with all the, all the little uh, trinkets or, you know, mementos or whatever, those, those, what are they called? Like souvenirs. souvenirs. Souvenirs of the Statue of Liberty always somehow miss the broken chains at her feet. Um, but that was about uh, the abolition of, uh, the supposed abolition of, of slavery. And um, uh, so I thought that Forever My Lady, you know, asking these questions about democracy was going to be taking apart the, the um, Statue of Liberty. Luckily, luckily, the artist Abigail DeVille is taking care of that. Um, uh, but yeah, that, so we have a piece from, that piece is from that show and there's another piece down the hallway called the Panix for Crystal Mason because we learned that the Panix was the, was the historic place where all men and all Athenian men should be clear, not everybody got to vote. Which, which it, it, it figures that that becomes what we get historicized as the birthplace of American democracy, of the, the American democratic project, which is that not everybody gets to vote. Um, so all Athenian men were, were meant to gather at the Panix to vote. And, and if you were caught in the Plata, when it was time to vote, if you were not at the Panix, uh, there were slaves who were sent out to walk uh, the Plata with a rope dipped in red paint, um, gathering people up. So if you got marked with red paint, if, you're, what is it, if your toga got marked with red paint, that meant that you were an idiot who was not out, when you were not where you were supposed to be when it was time to vote. And of course, we learned about all of the different ways that the voting process was perverted and, and corrupted. And, you know, it was an experiment that actually didn't last long because they kept getting conquered. So we just we were just like in the thick of it. And, um, you know, that was another one of the moments when I was thinking, like, maybe I shouldn't make art anymore, actually, because I thought. Share that with me at the time. Oh, yeah, I didn't share that with you at the time. But that's what I was struggling with because I was like, I don't know. Because like every time uh, every time I start thinking about something beyond myself historically, I end up sad, you know? So I was like, maybe I'm not supposed to do this. And then a friend of mine was working on a research project for a film about American democracy in which she had full access. She was really digging through the LBJ archives, the LBJ, the Lyndon Baines Johnson Library archives, and she had all these images. And um, she started sending me links, and I was like, oh, there it is. There's, a, there's that. There's, there's that cross-hatching of history. There's an opportunity here for me to um, explore these images of democratic processes, contemporary democratic processes, or it's not even contemporary anymore. But you know how there are these images of John Lewis and Ralph Abernathy and these, all these, uh, these other black activists, uh, Negro women lining up to shake LBJ's hand after the signing of the Voting Rights Act. Um, I became uh, excited again about um, exploring these images of uh, this democratic experiment. Um, but American democracy is, is way more informed by indigenous democratic ways that were adapted and assimilated to by first contact Europeans before they overthrew it. Um, so the, the, the brand of history that we get pri uh, prioritizes uh, this, this idea that, that we wouldn't have, that the only way of democracy worth looking at is a European, what, and, you know, poor Greek, I mean, you know, we see how Greece gets done inside of that pan-European context also, culturally, how they get, um, how, they, how they are treated inside of, you know, the, the, the Euro world. Um, but, you know, the history that we get here and that's embedded in our architecture prioritizes Greece. Um, but, you know, the more digging I did, the more I found that there were other ways of money exchange uh, and, uh, and um, you know, before the, yeah, whatever, before, you know, before the innovation of the foreclosure, 
which is foreign to English property law. You know, to alienate a male heir from their property was not something that was possible until it, needed, until it was needed to justify alienating indigenous people from their land. But before that, first contact Europeans adapted to, all indigenous people, wherever they are, I think, will find they had uh, processes, democratic processes. Everything wasn't simply like a monarchy or hierarchy in that way. Um, but a lot of that documentation is destroyed before we can really study it, so. I don't know, but Greece is a beautiful place and I loved it there. <laughs> oh, and so Edis took me to the, so Edis and Aristides Logothetis told me when we were up there, they were like, all of this marble comes from the same mountain. When they told me that, I was like, oh, you gotta take me to that mountain. You gotta take me to that mountain because the, there's still an active marble quarry there. So they were showing us all of the, um, all of the, res the restoration of the sacred monuments that, um, that are being done, that all that marble has to come from the same mountain. It's under, they have a different understanding of the value of their, their, their artifacts there, obviously. They're still trying to get their marbles back from the British Museum. Um, so they took me to that mountain, uh, and they took me, they took me to, the, to uh, uh, Dionysus Marble Quarry, where um, um, Sotiris, the, the foreman, was kind enough to literally let me take scoops of marble dust. We walked into the portals, and they, they, there was a pile of perfectly white marble dust that did not have any rat excrement in it that seemed to just be waiting for me. And, and somebody emptied out their purse for me, and we filled up her purse with that marble dust, and then we figured out a way to get it to the United States without getting me like, in trouble for trafficking drugs. And because, um, you know, it wasn't until I was like, it's time to go to FedEx, giant, and I realized I- Giant bag of white dust. Yeah, giant, yeah. I was like, oh. I was all excited. I was like, I'm gonna make paintings with this. And I was like, oh, I need to get this out of this, out of this country. Like, this is really, you know, not, this looks different. But yeah, that's when I started embedding the marble dust the same way I had with the, with the Lucy, oh, no, this, is, this happens afterward. The same way that I had been doing with Georgia red clay when I was making work about transportation in Georgia. So, you know, so look, using earthen material to make, uh, to make an, ex whatever, I'm going too far, but yeah, I, the marble dust started, that's when I started using the marble dust, and then I come here, and my brilliant curator takes me t into the Yule Mountain Quarry, and those guys, you know, they, 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 they did us one, they did us one more, they sent me buckets of marble dust, um, so I'm going to be working with the Yule Quarry marble dust for a long time, and then of course, famously, that's where the Lincoln Memorial and all these other sites have been unearthed for what we understand as American de Democratic Monuments. I think there's time for one more question. Sorry, y'all. Sorry. Ana Maria. I feel really Hello, good. incredible artist in her own right. Yes. So you have all these funny passages, you know, whether you're traveling, going to places, and what do you think about the fact that you have to go to the places where you can 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 go to um, I'm working right now, so I'm, I'm working on my next show for Night Gallery that opens on September 30, um, and that's called Minute by Minute, um, in homage to the 1978 Doobie Brothers album that my mother taught me to love and respect. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, oh, yes. So there's that, there's gonna be a public art commission that we're working toward. That's all I'm allowed to say, Megan's like, quiet! Um, uh, no, she's not. That's, that's, I'm, in, I'm totally joking. Um, yeah, I mean, just other, other stuff. Hopefully coming back here. Hope, hopefully, if the stars align, um, building a, building, finding out, figuring out some way that I can come here and make paintings in the summer so that I can work in Massachusetts in the winter. <laughs> um, yeah, just hopefully being alive and, um, and uh, making work. We have a, oh yeah, oh, my next show. So the, op the show opens at Night Gallery in Los, in Los Angeles on the 30th, and then I'll go to Great Britain and start doing material research for my first show at Pilar Correa's Gallery in London that will be in March of next year, and then after that it'll be time for my next show at Tilton Gallery in New York to go home, so. Yeah, I'll be around. So this is why I'm, I'm hoping that it can make sense, that I can you know, build a space, that I can be here because I really feel drawn. You all have, I mean, whatever's happening, look, I don't even understand. I remember it's not, as Adam Gildar has helped me understand, it's not my business to understand why I feel so connected here, but I'm just gonna keep trying to come back. Oh, that, that's, the per that's where we wanna end this. <laughs> um, so Tamashi, thank you so much for your time and talent. <laughs>